Hello, I'm Pilar Gerasimo, a founding editor of Experience Life magazine, and I'm here with Peter Freed, who is a celebrity photographer, former New York Times photographer, and the author and creator of a beautiful new book called Prime, Reflections on Time and Beauty. And I'm here to interview him about it because we're really honored to have a gorgeous photo essay of Peter's photographs and the essays of the women he included in his book in our November issue of Experience Life magazine. So Peter, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me. Thank you for wanting to talk to me. It's my great pleasure. Well, I feel very lucky because I understand that you've been getting quite a lot of attention for this forthcoming book. It's not even out yet, but there's kind of a feeding frenzy of media attention around it because it's such an unusual concept. Would you describe a little bit about what the book is? I mean, the book, some think the book isn't that unusual, you know. Some think that uh, we've dealt with aging and women and beauty before in different ways, but uh, maybe what separates it from the pack is that um, they are portraits of women from 35 to as old as 104, mm -hmm. and they're linked with uh, essays that the women themselves wrote about aging, life, loves, happiness, how to find happiness. And their purpose. There's really and a lovely purpose. sense of yeah. what these women have contributed as human beings beyond their beautiful appearance. Yeah, I mean, it's not about beauty per se, but the personality and the imagery, uh, even though they're without makeup, some may say uh, they weren't that comfortable not wearing makeup, but uh, it's raw both in the writings and in the imagery. I think it is unusual. I mean, for us, we've been so socialized to see women in photographs very heavily made up, very, you know, impressively photoshopped. There's a lot of styling and extravagant lighting. And um, I think many of us are very concerned that if we appear in photographs without all of that special treatment, we somehow won't be seen acceptably. I mean, we, we will not even be normal, much less beautiful. And you really, I think, turned that proposition around by photographing these women in a way it's very elegant and very simple and beautiful. The beauty of the women comes through the photographs, so I think you deserve some congratulations well, for having thank pulled you. that up. Yeah. yeah, I know. Somehow it's acceptable for a man to have wrinkles. It's a, a sign of uh, deep thought and intelligence, but if the slightest wrinkle shows up on a woman, it's, right. uh, it's running off to the plastic surgeon, <laughs> surgeon or the, uh, the uh, injections or yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we live uh, in a lot of terror, I think, of you losing our beauty and our value as we age, mm -hmm. um, something that our mutual friend Cindy Joseph talks a lot about in her yep. work. So I want to ask you a little bit about the process. I mean, first mm -hmm. of all, how did the idea come to you to create this particular book and concept? I saw a picture maybe five years ago, I think it was Demarchier took it in, uh, in Harper's Bazaar, and it was, uh, it was a portrait of the five great supermodels, some of them uh, already older in their 50s and 60s and they had no makeup it was in black and white it was very um, very stark you know no retouching and that triggered an idea to do the book but also the Dove campaign where they um, <clears throat> showed a woman coming into a photo studio uh, with no makeup and and the whole process that they went through to take the picture that eventually got on the cover She's the retouching. yeah she was I mean they just <laughs> After the makeup and after the Photoshop and the lighting and everything else, it was really unrecognizable from the woman that walked into the studio. Yeah. And raising two daughters, growing up with two older sisters, I was aware of the issues of, of, of not living up to maybe what they saw on the cover mm -hmm. of magazines or, or on features or in advertisements itself. And, uh, and so it had teeth for me, you know. That's amazing. Mm. I think so many millions of people saw the Dove campaign and can relate to what you're describing. And at the same time, I think so many of us have had this experience of looking in the mirror um, with our own bare face. We're, we've seen our own bare faces thousands of times, but saying, I wouldn't set foot outside the door without something. <laughs> you know, and every woman has a different list of without mascara, without lip gloss, or right. without something. So was um, the experience of shooting women, these are women who range from authors like Brene Brown and Danny Shapiro to supermodels who like Christy Turlington or Cindy mm -hmm. Joseph who's mm -hmm. become a very popular model. And then every stripe of, of person in between, entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. um, humanitarians and people with amazing projects, doctors, lawyers. Mm -hmm. How did they respond to being photographed? I'm curious. And I think they were more nervous overall about writing their essays <laughs> even though point. yeah i mean <laughs> the introduction of the essay i mean not everybody's a writer alexandra fuller i mean she had maybe less of a problem brene you know is used to her her point and her stance on things so right. it might have come a little easier but 
But I think um, posing without makeup, initially it was maybe a little bit of a concern for them, but uh, you know, with the advent of digital cameras, they were able to see the picture right away and Lovely. see what I did with the lighting and, and the angles. And that's kind of what my profession is based on at its best is not just the after effects, but you know, the experience of being able to read a face and, and um, through shadows and lighting kind of uh, take advantage of the positive aspects or positive, that's not the right word, but you know, the positive attributes of certain features. Yeah. And you know, I, I applied myself to that and in most cases it worked. If it didn't, uh, there were a handful of reshoots where I just wasn't satisfied. And strangely enough, it was with people who I was friendly with, who I had a relationship with. You were too close. To I was too subject. close to be objective, you know, and, and I, I see them the way they are, you know, foibles, and, and I don't see them the way the rest of the world does. So I had to kind of get beyond that and clear that slate and just kind of try to capture them from the stranger's point of view, yeah. if you will. One of the things that I read um, that you wrote about the, the experience or the inspiration in writing the book was your perception of women getting better beyond a certain age and that, you know, while younger women have a beauty all of their own, mm -hmm. women, you know, 40 and over sort of enter what you see as the prime of their life and thus the title. I would love for you to explain a little bit what you mean by that and because I think for a lot of people, particularly women who have been... Um, repeatedly told by the media that, you know, you're, after 30 you're washed up, your mm. beauty fades. Why do you think that women become more in their prime after 40? Yeah, I mean, that's a, you could say it's a preference of mine maybe, but also as, I, as it turns out, friends of mine, people I associate, men I associate with, um, and maybe it's an appreciation of experience over skin tautness or, you know, yeah. whatever comes with you. <laughs> or inexperience, yeah. uh, an appreciation of an inner beauty that comes through, uh, that transcends yeah. uh, the obvious outer beauty, or um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, you meet enough people, and I certainly met my share over 32 years as a photographer, um, you start to look beyond the surface mm -hmm. because otherwise every picture looks the same. So maybe my attempt to find a deeper meaning, not just in people, but in things, left me with a more visual acuity mm -hmm. um, than most. And I think we all have it. I think we've been trained improperly by the media and by the press yes. and by the visual medium of what beauty is, you know. But uh, beauty is, is the most beautiful person in the world can be ugly if their heart isn't in the right place or their soul isn't in the right place. Mm -hmm. And that's so visually evident to me and to other people like myself who are looking for that yeah. in people and experiences and jobs in uh, the work day. Yeah. You know. Well, and you've shot at a lot of celebrities, a lot of you know people who are famous for many things, but mm -hmm. many of whom have been famous for their beauty, I would imagine. Yeah. And so you're looking into the faces of all of these unmade up women. Was that right. an interesting creative experience for you? Um, I'm trying to think if that impacted me one way or the other. I mean, I always look at a photographic situation as a challenge, whether it's an environmental thing where I'm trying to balance what the person does with the environment they're in, in a portrait, in a one-shot portrait. So maybe this was just another one of my problem-solving, you know, <laughs> endeavors where um, now there's no makeup or it's all in black and white. And I haven't shot, shot black and white for quite a while. I yeah. started at the New York Times in black and white. And so now I didn't have the crutch of color to lean on yeah. um, or the crutch of an environment. I usually don't shoot on uh, seamless backgrounds. And I just had this now tattered gray background that I use to, um, to isolate the, the face almost as a landscape. So I, I really approached it almost I don't want to say clinically because there's an emotional, you know, part to it, but as a problem solving endeavor, yep. you know, and obviously from that and from my ability maybe with people or to bring out uh, certain aspects of a person's personality or just calming them down. I've been told I have that soporific effect on people <laughs> that, um, that uh, the images kind of came to the surface like they in the did. old darkroom days. Yep. So, and that's, so you've gotten some advance um, 
excitement about the book's uh, emergence, and mm -hmm. it, it comes out in when does it? Um, it should be finished at the printer in November. So about the same time that our article will be coming yeah, out. Yeah, maybe the end of November, and your article comes out at the beginning, I think. Which is so exciting. I'm so yeah. glad that it's working. The timing is so good. And yet, already, in, as people seeing previews of the photographs and reading other people's blogs about them, um, I, I've just heard great buzz about the book. Mm -hmm. And here in New York City, a lot of people are really excited to see it. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going on? What are you hearing back from people? Well, I'd like to say it's just such a good book that, you know, it transcended any type of advertising you might have to do <laughs> along normal channels. But it, it, that wasn't the case. I mean, this, um, I went to traditional publishers initially, and um, they liked it. They, they got the concept. Uh, we had multiple meetings at a bunch of different publishers. When the bean counters got in, uh, you know, it really wasn't about food or cats or dogs. So they're really, in this economy... Those are the books that are selling well. Yeah, right obviously. Yeah. So they really weren't willing to put their money where their visual eye was. Yeah. And, um, and plus they wanted to change it. The couple that were interested wanted it to be all celebrities or, mm. you know, could you make it a little sexier? And <laughs> <laughs> so I we really didn't, the waist yeah, yeah, the so yeah. I didn't really want to do that. Mm. And um, what happened was I went to Kickstarter, which if I had put this book together, um, even five years ago, it wouldn't have been available to me. And what happened from Kickstarter is that not only did it raise the money for the printing costs of the book, but it it generated its own publicity. And and from the Kickstarter publicity that came up, um, that's just inherent the way the framework of Kickstarter is, uh, newspaper articles, um, blogs. I mean, we were in over... 37 newspapers and magazines all across the world, really, in Rwanda, uh, all through Europe and Asia. Um, and the book, you know, I hadn't even finished, like, editing the book or <laughs> <laughs> the last picture. I hadn't even taken the last picture. But um, it snowballed. And that's kind of more a condition of the world we live in now and the, certainly the publishing world or the self-publishing world. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting to, to come out of the gate, or not even be out of the gate, to just be walking into the gate, already have that publicity. And um, it, it's, you know, I start getting nervous. Am I getting enough books printed? Yeah. Um, and I still don't know that. So Second printing. That's second printing, cool. yeah, but you got to pay and for second printing. Then there's a first printing. edition, which makes them that's even more That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about that. Well, I know. I mean, it's interesting. So you tapped into something. A lot like with the Dove campaign, same thing happened. It kind of went viral, right. and people got really excited about it, in part because I think it um, fills an appetite that people have right now for more authenticity right. and for, you know, tell me the truth about something. There's a thousand ways to lie with photographs right. and retouching, right. and even just real you know, teenagers on the street are retouching their own photos before yeah. they post them on Facebook or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so I think that there's a kind of there's a deep curiosity and a visceral attraction to looking at honest pictures, and that, from what I've heard at least, also from women, a hunger to see themselves reflected back at themselves in a way that they recognize. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny nowadays when I walk down the street in New York, especially because there's so many storefronts and reflective surfaces that every once in a while I catch my reflection as I'm walking down the street. And we're, we're all people watching in New York. Yes. So we make quick analytical decisions on the way people look um, based solely on the way they look because we're not looking at them. So once in a while I'll see my reflection walking towards me, <coughs> excuse me, and I'll see my father. Oh, so clearly, you know, I, I do look like my father. My sister tells me I do. I don't see it myself, but <laughs> in that do. one split second, I do. And I think in that sense, um, maybe a true picture and a raw picture of, of these women and them seeing the picture. Although, funnily enough, the, the women haven't, I didn't often show them the photo. So they'll be seeing it for the first time. Wow. Um, you know, when it comes out, some of them didn't want to see it. I found that, you know, if I showed it to them, all the kind of the upheaval of, you know, the way you see yourself yes. as a woman is so tainted with, you know, what your parents used to tell you or, yes. or what your sister told you or what that friend in sixth grade told you that you still carry on, that you have curly hair and that 
oh, I wish it was straight, or, you know, yeah. it, it just gets so mired in Did you get in to hear minutia. a lot of them? Oh, and yeah, Peter yeah, yeah. Like, well, Peter, could you just do yeah, sure. this thing, and that, I don't yeah. like this. And well, I didn't get a lot of, you know, don't, re, you know, could you just retouch this? They knew that was that, Because they knew that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, somebody with curly hair would constantly t be tugging at it, you know, wishing it was straighter. I mean, I have one daughter with with pin straight hair and one with hair like yourself, very curly, <laughs> and both have lamented that they wanted the other, yeah. you know. And uh, it, well, hair. that's the nature of, of women and their judgments about their looks. Yeah. But it's interesting. So let's just talk a little bit about what you're hoping to achieve with the book, because mm -hmm. um, obviously an enormous amount of work has gone into this book. How do you hope it will be received? What impact do you hope it will have on the people who see it? Every photographer wants a book of their photographs. It's um, I don't want to say the highest achievement, but it's a finite, um, you know, collection of imagery that's will be in the Library of Congress, and um, you can put your hands on, and it's not shoved under the bird feeder the way the New York Times was every day I shot for them, and um, <laughs> and and so that stands alone in terms of of what I get out of it, um, but. I realized when I got the essays in that really the main spine of, of the Prime book is uh, an attempt for the, the essays to actually help other women. You know, so many women are great storytellers and, and that's just a fact. You know, they're, they're gatherers and they gather stories the way a bee gathers pollen. You know, they immerse themselves in it. It gets all over them and they, they share and they tell stories. And, and these stories, hopefully, in my mind, will go on to help other women who maybe, as some of the women in Prime and many women nowadays who've gone through, you know, sickness and cancer and divorce and injury and uh, great loss and great happiness and not known what to do with any of those emotions, any of those circumstances, and somehow found their way out through the help of family, therapists. Um, you know, it's not a self-help book per se, but it is women speaking frankly about what they've been through, how they got through it, and where they are now. And not everybody's in their prime. I mean, that was you know a concept I started off with, but certainly the collection and the, the, the women I called for the book um, have made an attempt and, and had some success. How as, did you choose the women in the book? It's a really an interesting cross-section yeah. of women. I mean, I didn't choose them as much as they chose themselves. That's the link that holds them all together because I started out with friends and associates who I knew uh, were special or, you know, had something to share, something to give. And it just, the snowball started right away. I mean, they would say, oh, if you think I'm interesting, you should see my friend Sarah. You know, she went through this and she went through that. So in a way, they're all inextricably linked by the connection that they have, like in a family tree. One suggested somebody else, somebody else suggested two other people, and they're all part of that kind of connectivity that everybody talks about nowadays. That's so great. That's and so when great. I look at the pictures, and I'm you know, a typical dyslexic photographer who doesn't remember names, Pilar, <laughs> and, um, but I can look down at all 120, 130 pictures and I know their names because, yes, I mean, familiarity. I, I've been dealing with the layout and the sequencing and everything else, but also it was very impactful for me. Mm -hmm. And I, and it forced me to take the time to get to know these women, to read their essays, to reread them, to edit some of them down because we had to stay around 800, 900 words. Mm -hmm. and, um, and hopefully the reader will do that too. They'll see the pictures. The attempt uh, in setting it up with the picture on one side and the essay on the other is to make that initial impression that I was talking about, like when you walk down the street in New York City and you make an impression based on the visual, to read the essay and to be able to look back and maybe see the woman in a different way based on your knowledge of her or of what she's chosen to share. That's lovely. And it's interesting because some of the women are... Um famous by conventional standards, people like Christy Turlington, mm -hmm. but we, many people know her for her, her, her modeling work. And the essay actually touches on many other projects, humanitarian work, right. and the things that are the most important to her, and how she identifies yep. herself now, at least. And yep. it's lovely to get beneath the surface of people in that way. I mean, uh, there's uh, Christy, who's very involved in, um, 
in uh, birth rights of women and, and health issues of uh, women in third world countries who, are, who have a high mortality rate uh, from giving birth. And another woman who is on Wall Street and, uh, and uh, developed breast cancer and changed her whole profession based on her experiences and made um, prosthetics for bathing suits for women who uh, chose not to get uh, augmentation, I mean. And not all the stories are, you know, trials and tribulations, but those are the ones that come to mind. I mean, there is, there's uh, Olympic athletes who, uh, who are, um, were paralyzed. There's a woman who was paralyzed at the age of 20 and went on to be in the uh, Paralympics in the skiing competition. <laughs> She was in a magazine. She's a spokesperson for, um, for wheelchair rights. That's I'm neat. sure I'm saying that wrong. Wheelchair rights are for handicap. I don't even know if handicap's the right <laughs> word anymore. I'm trying to tread that line. But, the, yes, the yeah. languaging, anything can Handicapable, be I think it's the last one. Yeah. I like that. So it's interesting. I guess one of the reflections that, um, that I share with many people after having looked at the images is that there's something vaguely political about it. And, and I don't think that, I don't necessarily think that was your intention, but I think as a woman looking at it, um, collecting a body of work mm -hmm. like this and expressing mm -hmm. through the images and the essays, the fact that there is a, there's a, there particularly, there potentially is, and we can observe that there is a richness in the beauty that emerges in women over time. And you said it's a very different kind of beauty, obviously, at mm -hmm. 102 than it is at 22. Mm -hmm. But um, it's very reassuring, I think, for me at least, having reviewed them initially. And I right. am really honored to hmm. uh, have my portrait included in the book as well. well of course, that as, works as, out. as am I, yeah. We'll see. But um, just sitting for that image, I think, I suspect is a confronting experience for anyone. But I think that as people look at the images, they'll be profoundly reassured that there is there's beauty that is lifelong beauty. Right. And that it can get better, actually, over time. I mean, without getting overly heavy, I lost my mother this year, and um, you know, in our society, we don't really see our own species pass away normally. They're they're shuttled off to hospitals and this and that, and 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 it, it was an interesting experience, and I, I think one we all should go through, and it shouldn't be hidden. To actually, we watch birth with with great excitement and. And, and we celebrate that, and death should be celebrated also. And the celebration I found in it is that when my mother did pass away at a um, assisted living facility, actually at an elder care facility, um, it was a gentle departure, you know. And when she did uh, pass away, the second after, she was no longer there. I mean, I was able to look at her and see that the body that, that, that held her, you know, all the things that we think is so important, whether your eyeliner is right or this and that, is so superficial, you know, that, that, that what it reinforced for me wasn't so much that the body itself was this separate entity that we just kind of inhabit, but if in fact that wasn't my mother anymore, then the soul does exist. You know, so without getting too philosophical, it did reinforce something that I wasn't so sure of anyway, that the soul does live outside the body. Whether it goes into heaven or whether it goes here or there and we're reincarnated, it doesn't matter as much as the fact that it exists, that this life force in us actually exists somewhere and it doesn't only have to be in the body. So beauty mm. itself kind of supersedes what the body, how the body contains it. I mean, I know the two, I know it's a stretch to kind of pull the two of them together, but for me it isn't that much. I can totally see that. You know, yeah. so when you say a 104 year old, year old woman has a different beauty than a 50 year old, I'm not, I'm not so sure that's right, you know. If they say beauty is, is really, that the eyes are the, the doorway to that, you know, to the soul, to beauty, I think that's true. I think you just have to, I think we as a people just have to pinpoint our focus a little more mm -hmm. and not worry so much about the parts that are going to go away. Yeah. You know, and think about the parts that are here to stay, family, you know, experience, relationship, spirituality. That's a lot to have in a book of a collection of photographs. I mean, I really think that you've achieved that. And I suspect it will provoke 
a, a deeper range of thoughts as the ones you just oh, described yeah. it. If it does, then, then that's the biggest success I could possibly get. That's great. Well, I hope people will check it out. I suspect it will be a very successful book, and we'll be talking to you in a year or two about Prime 2. <laughs> uh, Prime Men, I think, is Prime what, we're, what I've been asked is to... Is that on your uh, list? Yes, it is. Excellent. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be trying to uh, focus our lens on men of substance. Um, not shot in the same way, maybe more environmental, and just men that are that are holding up the banner for for being righteous, for being not what we're made out to be. Mm. Not these brutes, not these men that don't call back when you uh, <laughs> go on the first date on you know Match.com or something. Yeah. yeah, good men. Good men, men with purpose, men with a direction. Yep. Nice. Well, we look forward to seeing that. And in the meantime, as I said, we're really honored to have your collection in our magazine in the well, November as am I. of Experience Life. And we'll watch for it. It'll be on bookstore shelves and mm -hmm. available on all of the online platforms. Amazon. And, yep. Where can people find out about your work now? Well, right now you can buy the book. Um, it's out for, I guess, pre-order, although by the time they see this and the article comes out, you can order it. And it will be sent right away on uh, theprimebook.org. Theprimebook.org. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking time Thank to you. talk with us today. It's been Thank an you, honor. Thank you, Pilar.